notes, if you would, to 2 Peter. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to look at just a few verses this morning together. Verses 12 through 15 here in just a second. Uh, but we're in this series through 2 Peter that we've entitled Grow Up. Uh, we don't mean that in the sibling kind of way, like grow up, like that kind of attitude. It's more of just, hey, let's grow. Let's continue to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's become more and more established so that when false teaching, as we're going to study in chapter 2, begins to uh, come at us, we're able to be stable and strong and not pulled into uh, their error. And so the idea that we think uh, is pretty clearly explained throughout the pages of Second Peter is to grow, to grow in grace, to grow in knowledge, uh, to grow in stability. And uh, that's why we've entitled it this way. And today, in verses 12 through 15, I think he's going to give us one of the key themes uh, of the, this letter uh, that's, that Peter wrote. Uh, one of the key themes that we find throughout here is this idea of reminders, to remind you, to remind again and again and again. Now, we are, we're pretty forgetful people, aren't we? I don't know if you could say that about yourself, but uh, we are. I don't know if you still have, have landlines. Does anybody here still have a landline, a phone, a landline that's like connected to your house? You guys know what that means, right? Some generation is like, what are you even talking about? Uh, some of us have landlines, but the, the reality is this. If you have a landline, you either are getting uh, telemarketing calls or warranty calls, or you're using it to call your cell phone because you can't remember where you put it, right? Like we've done that. And the reason you need your cell phone is because there's an app on there that tells you where you left your keys because you can't remember where those are. We, are. we are forgetful people. Do you remember when you didn't need anything, just your mind to remember directions? Like, I just know how to get home. Let's just, I just turn here and turn there. And I don't use my mind to remember directions anymore. I travel the same road over and over again. I still use maps so that this lady on my phone can tell me what to do, right? And that's what we do. And, and mankind has developed many creative ways to remember uh, things. We, we remember tying a string on your finger. Anybody ever do that? Tie a string on your finger? Let's see. Anybody? Nobody did. So it was advice that was given, but not very many people did it. It was like tie a string on your finger so that when you, a couple hours later, I guess, is the logic, see the string, it then reminds you why you tied the string there, which was a creative tactic. We've developed better things, I think, these days than tying strings on your fingers. Uh, things like sticky notes. Praise God for yellow sticky notes. I mean, what would we do? And then they don't even leave a residue on the thing you stuck them to. It's amazing. Phone reminders, I mean, remind me now, listen, this is great. If you didn't know this, you, you're going to learn something. I can set a phone reminder on my phone and make it remind me when I arrive at a location. Like, you know this, I know, but I just still think this is so awesome. So remind me to get milk when I walk into Walmart. As I pull into Walmart, my phone dings, don't forget to get milk. Like, we've come up with creative ways to remind us of things because we are forgetful people. And I find that in parenting, one of the biggest responsibilities in raising kids that I had no idea was such a big part of raising kids is the responsibility of perpetually reminding them of things again and again and again. <laughs> I say things like, I told you again, I've told you before, how many times do I have to tell you? Pick your shoes up. I think that might be two sermons in a row where I mentioned shoes lined up, but this is a problem, right? I'm reminding you. Or we say things like, if I've told you once, I've told you a million times, right? These are the things. Same for coaching, same for counseling. It's again and again and again. And the reason for that is one of the keys to growing in any arena, one of the keys, one of the vital keys in growing in any area, whether it be life or sports or marriage or work or whatever is reminders, to remind you again and again and again. And even though it might feel wearisome and burdensome, there's a value in reminding again and again and again. And Peter understood that. Peter understood that, which is why, according to our text today, Peter wrote this letter. So I want you to read it with me. First, uh, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 12 through verse 15, Peter tells us one of his hearts behind writing this letter. Now, you follow along as I read aloud, remembering these are God's words that he providentially intended for us to have preserved on these pages for us. These aren't my words. So let's read them. You follow along. I'll read out loud. Therefore, we'll come back to why the therefore is there. Therefore, I intend always 
to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Simple verse. God's words for us. Moved Peter, carried Peter to write these words, which captures the heart and the intent of the apostle, that we would be people who recognize the importance of reminders. And there's a big idea that I want you to get that I think is the intent of the author here this morning that sits over the top of this. It's this. Spiritual growth requires constant reminders of gospel truths already known. I believe that. The longer I've pastored, the longer I've been married, the longer I am a parent, the longer I am alive, the more I am aware of the vital importance of being reminded again and again, especially in the spiritual life that I'm living, of gospel truths. So what I think Peter has in mind here that actually is supported all throughout Scripture is that spiritual growth, growing in Christ, growing in this journey that I'm on, it, it, it demands, it requires this, this consistent reminding of gospel truths, truths that I already know, truths that he even says I'm already established in, but I want to remind you again and again and again. So no matter where you are in the Lord, if this is your very first time coming to church or you're still young and you're still kind of discovering new things, maybe you're in that journey and that is an exhilarating journey where you're discovering new verses, verses you've never seen before and you're like, this is in the Bible? What? And that's a great place to be but there's also this time when you get used to knowing that and and you get so aware of those things that that you almost get to the point where you're like I don't really need the reminders again I'm looking for the new thing you too also maybe more so need sound teaching to remind you often of the basic truths of the faith of the gospel truths so that you stay on course and stay established so why do we need the constant reminder I think in our text, our few verses, Peter reminds us why, or he helps us understand why we need the constant repetition of reminders of gospel truths. Why you just need, and I just need to lean into, remind me again, tell me again, sing that song again, hit it on repeat. Let's just remind ourselves of how beautiful and wonderful these gospel truths are. This is what Peter's intent is, and he gives us a few reasons for that. There's three of them I I see from the text that I think will help us. A little bit this morning. So here it is. I need reminding because, jot this down if you take notes. Number one, my memory tends to decline. Like, like, like that's just true, right? Like, I'm not trying to be funny here. That's really what he's saying. In, in fact, verse 12, he says it there. I, Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. What's he implying? He's implying that you tend to forget these things. So I'm just going to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them, that you know them and you are established in the truth that you have, you, you tend to forget. Your memory tends to decline. So I'm going to just continue to come back to these things. He starts this short paragraph with the word therefore. So what he's doing is he's tying verses 12, 13, 14, and 15 back to verses 3 through 11. He's tying it back. So, so the point he's making in 3 through 11 is, is beautiful and it's deep and there's a lot there. But, but in essence, it's because Jesus Christ is all sufficient. Because God has given us everything we need to grow in spiritual maturity. And, and because these qualities, these, these characteristics that the Spirit of God produces in us and leads us to and enables us to. Because this is true and they prove the reality of our faith, and and, and there's this promise that I'm not going to get into that Bradley did last week, but this abundant entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Like like he's talking about, this is a big deal. Christ is all sufficient. He's provided you power and promises and enabled you with his help and power and promises to now pursue virtues and godliness and brotherly kindness. And those things help you and encourage you and establish you in your faith. And he's saying, listen, therefore, I'm going to say it again and again and again and again. 
What Peter just finished saying, in essence, is that for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus, the Christian life is not a matter of searching for the resources that we will need in order to live as we should. Did you get that? He, he's not saying, okay, now, now you're on the team. Now go find resources that are going to help you accomplish your call. He's saying, no, you have everything you need already available to you in rich abundance. So he's saying through this, this text, the Christian life is not a matter of seeking power. It's a matter of resting fully on the sufficiency of Jesus himself and learning to make full use of what he has given us. For us, the Christian life is a matter of building on the foundation of faith with the materials that God provides and in the way that he enables. That's the Christian life. It's not a white knuckle, try harder, do better, find a way to get it, try to find a way to turn a corner. It's Christ is enough. He has supplied the power. Therefore, because all of that is true and all of that is indispensably necessary, I will always be ready to remind you of these things. Some of you have been in church all your lives. I'm one of them. I literally, I think, was in, I may have been born in the nursery. I'm not sure. But I definitely was there the very next Sunday, for sure. Some of us have been studying the Bible for years and decades. You've heard the truths over and over and over again. You can give me beautiful definitions of godliness and virtue and brotherly kindness and all of these things. You can do it and you understand what it is. And you get to the point where you study the Bible so long, you heard the truths over and over again. But you get to the point where you think, I know this. Right? We get so arrogant. We get so self-dependent. I do. I don't really need it anymore. I've got this down. And that's the problem that we can fall into when we get lists as we start to say, I know that, I know that, I know that, I'm pretty good at that, I feel pretty good about myself. And we've got to be careful that these things aren't things that we pat ourselves on the back over, but they are things that we recognize the sufficiency of Christ and the empowering of Christ enables us to pursue. And Peter's like, I'm just going to remind you of that again and again and again and again. And the reason is, is because you're a forgetful person. (laughs) You need reminding. We're fallen and fallible. We often get caught up in the trials and circumstances of life. Our eyes are often distracted from the promises of God. We panic in times of trial and we turn to the values and priorities and resources in the world. I love it when I read again a verse that I know and I'm like, man, I forgot that was in here. Thank you, God, for graciously giving me that reminder. In a way, we're an awful lot like Peter. Remember when Peter was in that boat and Jesus was walking on water? And he's like, hey, if it's you, tell me... Bid me to come to you. Let me, tell me to get out of the boat and I'm gonna walk to you. And Peter steps out of the boat and he's already beyond the realm of human explanation. He's walking on water and then the storm begins to shake and the waves begin to rise and the wind begins to blow. And all of a sudden he, outside of the realm of human possibility, walking on water, he takes his eyes off the source of his power, forgets where the source of his power is and probably starts to brace himself to catch himself walking on water. That's how we are. We walk and we live as if when things get rough, we forget that the real source of our power and the real sustaining grace is him, not us. You know, we're prone to forget this isn't new, this isn't American, this is human. That's why throughout the Old Testament, God often told the Israelites to erect memorials in the form of pillars of stone. Remember when they walked through the Jordan, he said, grab stones out of the Jordan and pile them up so that years from now when people come and see it and they're like, how did that get there? You tell them the story and remember the faithfulness of God. He gave them the Passover to be observed year after year so that they would remember how they were delivered from Egypt. He gave them the Feast of Tabernacles. This was a time when they would all camp outside Uh, uh, for a week each year like everybody would camp outside they set up tents coleman tents were probably all over jerusalem and uh, they were outside and they would then remember they would remember how god preserved them through their wilderness wanderings then he gives them the ark of the covenant and he tells them to put inside the ark of the covenant three things the tablets of stone with the ten commandments a jar of manna and aaron's budding rod All three represented significant events in their life and history, and God wanted them to remember. Why? Because they were prone to forget. Psalm 106 verse 13 says they soon forgot his works. 
In Deuteronomy 32, 18, tells them that you were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. You say, those Israelites, they're such pathetic people, forgetting what God did, and that's us again and again. This is why he gave us communion. In a few minutes, we're going to take communion. He gave us communion to be this memorial, to remember that Jesus in the flesh shed his blood for us, and it is the only hope and only source of our salvation. And we do it again and again and again, lest we get into the place where we start thinking church is all about us, our feelings, our emotions, our desires, and stop remembering that we are here because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Lest we forget. Remember, remember again, And again and again, Peter and Paul and others tell us to remember. Thomas Schreiner said it well in this sentence. He said, believers know the gospel, and yet they must, in a sense, relearn it every day. Every day. Jerry Bridges, in a book that he wrote called Four Essentials for Finishing Well, told us that we should regularly uh, warm our heart, often warm our heart by the gospel and by other essential truths often go back to the warmth. Milton Vincent said that you should preach the gospel to yourself every day. The key to being able to remember the gospel truths is to first know them and be established in them. So here's what I'm going to try to say to you is that don't grow weary. Don't start hating the preachers of this church when they remind you of things again and again and again because that's biblical teaching and preaching, expository preaching, studies, small groups, daily Bible reading and study, we are prone to forget. We need teachers like Peter who aren't trying to come up with a new thing. Like, hey, I just got this. Listen, if somebody comes to you and says, I just got something brand new that nobody's ever seen before, pack your Bible up, tip your cap, and run. Go to, go to another church because that is dangerous. Listen, it's the, it's the old truths It's the truths of God's word again and again and again, the gospel truths that we need again and again because we're prone or we tend to forget. Number two, let me show you. I need reminding because my motivation also tends to diminish. My motivation tends to diminish. And there's a key word that I think Peter has in mind, this in mind in verse 13. He says, I think it right. Now, let me stop right there. By stating he thinks it right, he's not so much commenting about the righteousness of his reminder. That's included. But I think he's seeing that his duty as an apostle of Jesus Christ, as a messenger. I think it's right for me to do this. It implies that he gave some thought. And after careful consideration, he considers it appropriate as an apostle to continually remind us of gospel truths. He's like, I've been thinking about this. And I've come to the conclusion, this is what I should do with the rest of my life. It's right and correct, as long as Peter draws breath, that he should endeavor to stir you up. Look at it again. I think it right, as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. The word stir you up, there's a, there's a sense of violence in this verb. Like, it's not just like a, a, a little nudge. It's like, wake up! It's like mornings when I ra- wake my kids up, right? When my son, especially Adrian, I, I wake him up and I, I move in and say, hey, bud, it's time to wake up. And I try to start nice. I really do. I really genuinely do. I grab his foot and I'm like, hey, bud, it's time to wake up. 30 minutes later, Adrian, listen, it's time to get up. 30 minutes later, Adrian, wake up. Then the water bottle's got to come out. I'm like, all right, cool, let's go. I'm stirring him. I'm poking him. I'm saying, wake up, arouse, get up, put your feet on the ground, stand up, get in that bathroom and brush your teeth. Your breath stinks, right? That's the way it goes. Waking my kids up is the same idea here. Mark uses this term in his gospel in Mark chapter four to describe Jesus being shaken awake by his frightened disciples in the boat when the storm was coming. So they ran down to the bottom of the boat where Jesus was sleeping and they're like, Jesus, No, the picture is completely different. It's, Lord, don't you care that we're about to die? Wake up, save us. That's that's the word. John uses the term to actually describe the sea itself beginning to stir as a monster being woken from its peaceful slumber. John uses the word intensely in that way. So what Peter reminds his readers is, is is, is to keep them from falling into an apathetic and lethargic complacency. And he does this several times. In fact, in your, in your Bible, jump to chapter 3. 
Just jump back to chapter 3. It's probably on the same page or one page back. And look at verse 1. He says, this is now the second letter I'm writing to you. Beloved, in both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. What I'm trying to do, literally, the word is, I'm trying to shake you awake. I'm trying to poke you awake. I'm trying to say, wake up. Wake up. You're, you're falling asleep. You're, you're entering into a lethargic state of complacency. Wake up. He, he, he does it in the first letter he wrote, too. So you're in 2 Peter. Now flip over to 1 Peter and look at chapter 1. So it's probably three or four pages to your left. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Here's what, here's what Peter says in verse 13 of 1 Peter, the first letter he wrote, chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. What those words capture is the same intent. I'm waking you up. I'm stirring you up. Prepare your mind. Wake your mind up. Get your mind ready. Be sober-minded, be alert, be awake, be ready. And then he says it later in 1 Peter, one more spot, chapter 5. And look at verse 8. Here's why it's so important. This is an important verse in regards to this stirring awake. Notice what he says in verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Be awake, be alert, be uh, 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 not lethargic or, or complacent. Be watchful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You see, it was as if Peter recognizing, listen, the enemy is active. The enemy is awake and he is alert and he's trying to devour you. And in 2 Peter chapter 2, he shows us one of the tactics of the enemy is the false teacher spreading doctrinal error. And so he's saying, I want to remind you of gospel truths. I want to remind you of the sufficiency of Christ and the pursuit of Christ empowered by the power and promises of Christ I want to remind you again and again to stir you up, to wake you up, to make your mind alert. Why is this so important? Well, it's because we all tend to drift towards complacency and indifference. The cares of this world that we live in, let's just be honest, bills never stop coming. Schedule never stops coming. Work always is calling on us. Kids are always needing us. Hobbies always need some attention. Come on. Temptation is always there. Sickness is always present. Loss is always real. The worries and the cares and the, the, the entertainment of our world is always upon us. And all of this effect on us distracts us and lulls us into complacency and indifference. We live in a world and the world tends to get all over us and distract us. Listen, it's just the reality. You tend to get distracted. This is why Peter is saying, I want to wake you up by reminding you. I want to remind you. In fact, this is why the writer of Hebrews said that we should continually meet together as a church. He said it in chapter 10, verse 24. He says, consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So you have a ministry of waking each other up. There are times that maybe not physically, let's avoid that, but at least uh, 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 relationally, you're saying, hey, wake up, bro. Wake up, sister. Wake up to what Christ has done for you. Let's go. Peter hoped that his words would stab them. That's the, a, a, a way the word is used, to stab the believers awake so that they would reject what the opponents taught. Wake up. The enemy's there. They're outside the gate. Wake up. False teaching's coming. They're right outside. They're coming. They're coming after you. Be, get ready. Wake up. I'm sure that this portion of this letter, when Peter wrote this, he remembered vividly a time when the world got all over him and he became complacent. There's a story in the Gospels where Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember? Peter was there with other two disciples and Jesus went off to pray and what did Peter do? He fell asleep. Jesus comes to him and he says, hey, wake up. Can't you pray with me a little bit? He goes to pray again and comes back a little bit later and Peter's sleeping again and he said, wake up. Satan desires to have you. He desires to sift you as wheat. He desires to attack you. He is like a roaring lion, prowling, seeking whom he may devour. Stay awake. Stay alert. It, it, was, it was just before that sleeping time that Peter told Jesus, if I have to die, I will never leave you. And Jesus said, actually, 
this day before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So he makes this promise, then he falls asleep into this place where he should have been, according to Jesus, watching and praying with Jesus. And it was that same night that he was warming himself at the fire while Jesus was arrested. And they said, hey, you were with Jesus. And he said, not me. I never knew that guy. And they said, no, I'm pretty sure you, you knew him. And he said, not me. I don't know that guy. And a third time they said, no, I know you were with him. And he began to curse and deny that he even knew Jesus. You see what he was saying? I think he is saying this because he has scars of remembering the time that he was lulled to sleep in complacency. He thought, I've been following you three years. I'll never leave you. He took it lightly. He got complacent. And just that night, he began to deny Christ. So Peter's saying, guys, listen, I'm saying this because I have personal experience. Don't fall into lethargic mindsets. Listen, Listen, just listen, lean in, please. Do not grow indifferent towards the things of God. Even now, it's easy for us to sit in a service like this and already be thinking about the honeydew list that we got to do when we go home. Or I wonder if my seat's going to be taken at the restaurant. Or I wonder what game is on because football season's over and baseball season hasn't started yet. So what am I going to watch this afternoon? Right? I mean, those are the types of things that come into our mind, or I got to take care of that bush, or I got to listen. And, and all of those things, if we're not careful, just lull us into this indifferent, lethargic mindset. And if we're not careful and we don't remember what Christ has called us to, what Christ has enabled us for, that Christ is sufficient and capable of producing in us godliness and all of the rest of the virtues that he lists for us, we will be lulled into an indifferent state. And the best and most biblical teachers are intent on not just reminding you of truths, but using those truths to stir you up. Man, we need that. I need reminding because my motivation tends to diminish. So engage again God's word. Engage again the truths of God's word. I want to show you a third thing that I think Peter gets at pretty clearly in our text. I want you to see it because he's pretty raw and honest. And, and that's this. I need reminding because, number three, my mentor tends to depart. Now, that may not seem explicitly obvious what I'm getting at, but I, I want you to see this. Look at verse 14. So verse 13, he just says, I think it's right as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. But verse 14, he says, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. The word Peter uses here is translated body. It's the word tent. He's using the word tent intentionally to speak of the temporary nature of his earthly body. Peter was aware, he says it here, he was aware of the fact of his imminent death. It's, it's close, I'm, I'm about to die. That's what he's saying, I'm about to die. And he says that he knows this because our Lord Jesus Christ made it clear to him. Now, you could study that out, and there's all kinds of legendary stories of when Christ told him this, and they've come up with some crazy ways to explain this. But I think it's safest as a conservative biblical believer to understand that this is a reference back to John chapter 21, when Jesus and Peter were talking at the end of Jesus' life. And in John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19, Jesus tells him uh, that you're going to get old, you're going to get old, <laughs> Like, this is just inevitable, Peter. You're going to get old. You're going to live into your old age. But then he says, you will stretch out your hands, which we think is a, a reference to the fact that he will be crucified as a martyr. He told him that when he reached old age, the time would come when he would stretch out his hands and he'd be taken where he didn't wish to go. Church tradition tells us, history tells us, that Peter was crucified for his faith in Jesus Christ in the city of Rome. And when Peter wrote the words of our passage that we're reading this morning, he was already an older man. So he's like, all right, I've reached old age. I'm an old man. I don't know how old he was. We could guess based on some history, but we, he was an older man, and he knew that he would not die of old age. He didn't know exactly when he would die or how he would die or where or the time that it would be, but he knew that his life would be taken from him. And based on what Jesus told Peter about how he was going to die, Peter knew that because of what was beginning to happen around him in the world, his death was close. In fact, just maybe you'll enjoy a short, quick history lesson, but 
that what began to happen around the time when this letter was written on July 19th, 64 AD, a fire ignited in Rome and it raged incessantly for six days and seven nights. Half of, of, of the city's 14 wards were burned to the ground. At the time, Nero was the Roman ruler and he was not a nice guy. He's not, he's not Brother Nero. He, he's not welcome in our church, <laughs> at least not as he was there. Of all the atrocities that we could share, and you've probably read about, perhaps one of the worst is that he had his own mother, Agrippina, and his wife, Octavia, put to death so he could marry another. And when the fire broke out, Nero was, it says, tells us that he was in his nearby birthplace, Antium, but he hurried back to Rome because he wanted to enjoy the sight from a window in his palace and the, the story tells us, again, we can confirm, I wasn't there, but as we read the history, tells us that he was singing the burning of Troy while playing his guitar. This is what the legend, the history tells us. So it's all to capture this guy was clinically insane. In fact, people suggest that he actually was certifiably pathologically insane. Soon, well-rounded rumor circulated that Nero himself ordered the destruction. He ordered the burning so he could build it back the way he wanted it to be. And, and they began to be caught uh, uh, on. They began to catch on and people began to spread them. He made several unsuccessful attempts to remove the suspicion, but now he was in a bind and he needed a scapegoat, someone else that he could blame for the catastrophe of fire. And so he succeeded doing this by spreading the false rumor that there was this sect of people known as Christians who started the fires. So he issued a decree from that point on that Christianity was religio illicita, which is illegal, illegal religion. Christianity was now an illegal religion, and the Christians were to be arrested and punished. And this is when one of the most savage and wicked persecutions of Christians began to take place in Rome. Many Christians perished throughout the empire, including the apostle Paul and Peter. As credible tradition tells us, Peter was crucified upside down in this era. So here's what's going on. Get that as your backdrop. With the persecutions raging, Peter did not lose heart. He's like, listen, I know my time is coming. Nero's crazy. He's coming for me. Jesus told me I wouldn't die of old age. I'm an old man and about to die of old age. So my death is coming. It's imminent. And he knew that from that day forward that he would glorify God in what appears to be a death by martyrdom. So Peter knew for over 30 years of serving Christ that he would die this way. He would give his life for Christ, and he understood that his days. But here, here's what's going on. Knowing this was coming soon, his desire and strong effort was that after his departure, they would look at it again in verse 15. I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. What he was doing was he was making every effort to prepare these Christians for when he was no longer around. He knew that he would not be around much longer to be their mentor and their leader. He knew. Therefore, he needed to make sure that they were not just following him, but that they were well grounded in the truth of the gospel given him to him to teach them. He wanted their faith not to be in him as the messenger, but in the message that God had called him to deliver. Why is this important? Here's why this is important. Because our mentors tend to depart, some through death, some through God's movement. And we are inclined as men to follow dynamic and charismatic leaders and associate ourselves and our faith with the mentor or teacher that God has used in our lives. Far too often, we get our faith grounded upon the personality that God used to deliver the message to us. And our faith is shaken and shattered when that person leaves or departs or dies or moves to another place. And our faith is interwoven into the personality in our life rather into the truth that that person delivered on behalf of God. Now, by the way, we ought to be extremely grateful for the people that God has brought into our lives as messengers and mentors who taught and led us and discipled us. We should honor them and we should remember them. Today, though, we have access to more biblical teaching online than we could possibly consume in several lifetimes, a lot of which I am thankful for, a lot of which I am not, but a lot of which I'm thankful for. If we're not careful, listen, listen, this is, I think, important. If we're not careful, our Christian faith can be founded upon the human leader that we follow. 
In fact, that's what Paul says in Corinthians when he condemned this attitude in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4, when he says, one says, I'm from Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos. Are you not merely being human? He says, who is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants, that's who they are. They're servants whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Don't line yourself up with the personality that God led to help you and disciple you. Love them and appreciate them, but cling on to the truth of the message that they delivered. And Peter desired, knowing that he was about to die and be gone, that these people to whom he was writing and us today would still be able to be strong and steadfast and growing and standing against false teachers. And I need to be reminded, I need to be reminded that my faith should be built strongly on the truth of the gospel and the person of Jesus Christ delivered to us, yes, by human messengers, but not upon the messenger, upon the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In order to serve the church after his death, he intends to leave them a reminder so that they can recall these things. I think the reminder is this letter. He's like, I'm going to write this down so that you remember, because I'm leaving. I'm leaving. And here's, again, let me finish this up by saying the, the best and most biblical teachers the teachers that you should get into and, and and should seek to let influence your life are teachers that aren't afraid to say the same thing again and again and again and again the gospel the gospel based upon the word of god and and they do it not in a way just to inform you so that you're like i say a theological fathead but so that the truth that you are reminded of stirs you up to be aware of the enemy's attack and, the, and the, the opportunity you have through the power of Christ to live the life he's called you to. And they are not calling you to be their disciples. They're calling you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Listen, God may move me and all of the pastors that you ever sit under. Your faith and your hope and your Stability cannot be dependent upon the man that God is using in your life. It must be dependent upon the man who is the focus of the gospel. His name is Jesus Christ. So never get to the point in your Christian journey that you feel like you no longer need to engage the known truths that you are established in. Embrace the consistent preaching and teaching of the word of God and the constant reminders of the gospel truths that are delivered in it. You need to remind him because your memory tends to decline. And the older we get, the more that's true. Amen? Amen. You need reminding because your motivation tends to diminish. And you need reminding because your mentors tend to depart. And you need to remember where your hope and stability is found. So I'm going to give you a couple thoughts real quick, rapid fire, a couple learning to lives, and we're going to pray and go into time of remembrance and communion. I just want to say to you, apply this teaching by reading your Bible. If you don't have a regular, disciplined time in God's word, read the Bible over and over and over. I promise you it'll change your life. I promise you. It's, it may seem rigorous at first, but it's like a good diet. Once you get used to it, you can't live without it. Memorize key portions of scripture. Memorize it. Man, just engage it through frequent repetition. Regularly sit under the faithful ministry of the word. Find biblical teachers and preachers and engage regularly. Just sit there and just allow the truth of the gospel to come again and again and again and again. And then I'd say lastly, to supplement all of that as a supplement, not as a primary means, but read solid books that will help you grow. Supplement your Bible reading. It's helpful. None of these are new, but I'm just reminding you of something you already know. <laughs> Three learning to live questions, and we're done. Let's apply these, okay? Here we go. Three quick. Number one, ask yourself this question. Am I embracing the reminders of gospel truths I already know? Am I embracing it? Listen, right now, you, you ought to be in a place where you're like, hey, thanks again for reminding me of things I already know. But first, start with, do you know them? 
In order to embrace reminders, we must first already know and be established in the truths of the gospel. And the gospel is the message that Jesus Christ was born, lived a perfectly sinless life. Then Jesus was crucified unjustly as a sacrifice in our place for our sin. Then three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, signifying that his sacrifice for our sin was accepted as a satisfactory offering, and our sin and death was defeated. Now, whoever places their faith and trust in Jesus to save them will be made alive spiritually and have the hope of eternal life. That's the gospel in a nutshell, and that's where you start. You cannot be reminded of something that you don't already have an established knowledge in. So start with faith in Christ. Trust the gospel. Am I embracing? Number two, am I engaging in the rhythms where I am reminded of gospel truths? God, in his loving grace, has given us regular recurring rhythms that we can engage in, that serve to remind us again and again and again of these truths. It's communion, it's worship, it's fellowship, it's study, Bible reading, gatherings in church communities and studies and mentoring relationships. Listen, God is so good to us that he gives us these means of grace that remind us again, that stir us up and encourage us and bolster our confidence. They need to be engaged with. Let me encourage you to engage in the rhythm that God has provided for us. Number three, and we're done. Am I enlisted in the ministry of reminding others of gospel truths? This is a beautiful thing that as a part of the body of Christ and as a member of the church, we are called to serve each other. And one of the ways we serve each other is by saying, look again, look again, it's Jesus. As we deal with marriage help or parenting help or temptations, we ought to be people who are encouraging each other by telling them, look again at the gospel, look again at Jesus Christ. Engage, embrace, and enlist in the ministry of reminding others of gospel truths. Spiritual growth requires constant reminders of gospel truths already known. Amen?